I want to welcome you back to the 11th hour today as we got on our road to the future, our road to destiny. It's already been a good day. It's already been a good time. Music sounds, man, I don't know if any of you out there heard some of that, but some of those sounds, we just turned and looked at each other. And we hit frequencies and sounds, and the emergency light even came on in the back of the building. I mean, it was like, it was like it was awesome. This is an urgent time. Hallelujah. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the anointing. Lord God, we choose you, and we choose the anointing over anything else we can see, feel, or hear. We walk by faith and not by sight. For you are our God. No matter what the world says or does, you're still the living God. And you're the one that created everything that is. And in you, we live, we move, we have our being. Hallelujah. Your word declares that you are our life and the length of our days. And there's not a devil in hell will ever be able to change that fact. Because when it's all said and done and over, you are still here and we are still in you. Even when the devil is burning like a mashed cow patty out in the middle of hell, you are still God and we are with you as your children. I ask you to encourage the people watching today. Encourage those listening in their cars today. Encourage them, Lord God, about their families, their children their jobs, their livelihoods, how you how are bringing this in to them. And Lord, that no matter what devil tries to stifle their vision with derogatory remarks, with, with depression, with saying things, Lord, that would curb enthusiasm, we are the wildest enthusiasts in the world in Christ. In you, our hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I want us to open our Bibles up today to Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, I want to look at verse 25 and 26. Hebrews, it's, it's absolutely an amazing book. Praise God. Now, I want us to see some things here. It says, in verse 25, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall, we, uh, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. Take note of all of that. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only but also heaven. Now, I want, to, I want to look, first of all, at the word speaketh. God speaks. Notice that it said that. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Now, he speaks, first of all. God uses his tongue. This is what it means. He uses his tongue to talk, his faculty of speech, his voice to declare his mind, and disclose his thoughts on the earth. People may say, well, God don't have a tongue. Really? I've heard people say that God doesn't even really have a form. Do you know I've heard people say that? They say he has no hands. I'm talking about believers now, Christians. Say that the Father has no hands, but that he is only spirit. Well, on the Mount of Temptation, Jesus himself said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If God has a mouth, then he has a tongue. And if he has a tongue, then he can speak. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God said, <laughs> let there be light. All through Genesis 1, and God said, and it was, God said, and he saw. Isn't that amazing? He speaks, and this is why he speaks. Now, listen to this. So you see that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, on earth. So he spake on earth. 
Why? He spake on earth, especially in the Old Testament. He spake on the earth. Now, he still does, but mainly them was the main thing, one of the main things. He spake on earth to declare his mind, disclose his thoughts on the earth. The reason he spoke on earth, mostly in the Old Testament, is he spoke, he spoke on earth to transact business, especially to manage public affairs. <laughs> That's something. Now, this is all Hebrew wording I'm looking at. God spake on earth to transact business, to manage public affairs. He spake on earth to advise with one about public affairs. He spake on earth to make, uh, to answer, to make, to answer to those who ask for his advice. For those who present inquiries for requests, etc. He spake on earth for judges and magistrates, rulers and kings because they don't know how to do any of that without him. He spake on earth to give a response to those consulting an oracle. People consulted oracles in the day. Well, he spake on earth to give people an answer. He spake on earth to give a divine command or admonition. He spake on earth to teach from heaven. He spake on earth for men to be divinely commanded, admonished, and instructed. He spake on earth to prophets to be the mouthpiece of divine revelations, to promulgate the commands of God. He spake on earth to assume or take to oneself a name for one's public business. All this bears a lot of meditation, doesn't it? And he spake on earth to people and I include to prophets to be the mouthpiece, but especially prophets. He spake on earth to receive a name or title to be called. Now, Hebrews 12, 26 says this, whose voice then shook the earth. Now, listen to this. His words, this is what shook is talking about. His words produced motion. Wind, storms, waves, a motion produced by wind, storms, waves, etc., to agitate or shake, to cause to totter, to shake thoroughly of a measure filled by shaking its contents together, to shake down, overthrow, to cast down from one secure and happy state, to move, agitate the mind, to disturb one. Now, why would the earth tremble and shake when God spoke on it? Because it was trying to get back to its normal state. The earth trying to get back to the original state God spoke it into being to be. And so when God would speak on the earth, the earth would shake and moan and try to make itself go back to where it was. And then the wind would, would blow and the waves would howl and the earth would shake. Because it was trying to get back to its normal state. Satan's war had turned it upside down. Every time God speaks, he's transacting business. He's giving men response to what they've asked for. And the earth that is held in bondage and made subject to vanity is groaning in travail together to right itself back to what it was spoken into existence to be. When this would happen, red seas would part. The earth would tremble. Hailstones would fall. Things would happen. We see them astounding in the Old Testament. This was God speaking on earth, a result of him speaking on earth. Hebrews 12, 25 says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So now he's speaking from heaven to transact business and public affairs and so forth. He's speaking through his body, through his church. Hebrews 12, 26 says, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more 
I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Now he's shaking heaven. Now, let me read the definition of shake. To shake, to agitate, to cause to tremble of men. To be thrown into a tremor, to quake for fear. And metaphorically, to agitate the mind. Now he's speaking in the New Testament from mostly heaven, still on the earth too, by revelation, giving illumination, inspiration, living under grace. Men must hear from heaven or how will they escape? His words coming through his body now agitates men. Have you ever noticed that? It causes them to tremble, to be thrown into a tremor, to quake with fear, because when they hear the word of God spoken, it's like the creation would shake itself trying to get back to its normal state, trying to go back to where when they hear the voice of God, the creation reacts and tries to right itself. It's groaning in travail together, wanting the sons of God to be revealed to it. This thing, when you speak now and he shakes heaven, he's speaking through his body and when men start talking about Jesus and they start talking about salvation and they start talking about heaven and hell, men begin to tremble and be thrown into a tremor because deep down inside, even the lostest man, when they hear the word of God, it longs down inside them. to Something wants to come back. It's that spark of light that was in there wants to come back to the creator and it troubles men's minds and they get agitated and they get mad and they lash out and they quake with fear. Why? Because it, why would it cause men to tremble this way? Because it frightens their God. The God of this world the scripture declares in James 2, 19, it says, thou believest that there is one God he said, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Tremble, it means to bristle, to stiffen up, to stand up, to shudder, to be struck with extreme fear, to be horrified. That demon that lives in them and trembles inside them when they are confronted then they bristle up and they lash out. You had never seen people lash out against somebody witnessing to them. They lash out, they're struck with extreme fear and they're horrified. I heard a man argue who is supposed to be an atheist. He was arguing the existence of God. And the one thing that kept coming up was hell. He kept bringing up hell. He was afraid of hell, and he didn't want to believe he could go there. This is God speaking from heaven now, and it causes demons to tremble because they know there's only one God. Now, he still speaks in the earth, but think about now under grace, he's speaking to men, and that inside them longs to get out, and it agitates that devil they're serving. And it, that devil begins to shudder and quake to its very core, and men will bristle up and, and bark out against God. And they'll do anything to shut it down. Righteousness can come to a, a town, every major city or every town you see that actually has prosperity and begins to grow and have a future. There's some kind of church in the middle of it somewhere that is preaching and it, it grows and it grows and they're talking about Jesus and they're talking about the blood and they're talking about these things. And then there's always those and we want to open a bar in it. We want to open a, a strip joint in it. We want to open this in it. We want to create an atmosphere for people to propagate the selling of drugs and, and, and fentanyl and all this kind of stuff. We want to poison the people's mind. It's that devil inside them. It's bristling up because really deep down inside them, that light begins to convict and that their being wants to come back to God. But that devil won't let them come. 
It said, you need to take heed because if those in, in the days when he spoke on the earth couldn't escape, he said, how will you escape if you refuse him speaking from heaven? He speaks on the earth. He speaks from heaven. When God speaks, he is preparing something. Now, I want to uh, bring this out right now. When he speaks, he's preparing something. He is producing motion. That's what the scripture talks about. It means motion. When he speaks, things are set in motion. See, anything that's, that's stagnant dies. Anything that has no movement in it just dies. And when God speaks, it animates. When God speaks, man lives by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. And when he speaks, the earth reacts. Men react one way or the other. And people say, well, all this stuff happening out here, there's many reasons storms, hurricanes, earthquakes, and stuff happen. And God's not causing them, making them happen in order to punish men. Some of it is for seed sown. Did you know that, <clears throat> that a lot of times earthquakes, if, if well, we don't have time to get into that, but not all of them, but some of them are caused when a servant is exalted above their master? Do you know that? People that are not anointed to be king becomes king. When bramble bushes arise above the trees, some of you will get that. It causes the earth to react in a shaking. Did you know that there are things that, that cause uh, the whirlwinds? And, and a lot of times whirlwinds like in Elijah and Elisha's day. This whirlwind kicked up and hid Elijah and Elisha from the view of the unbelieving prophets. It hid them from view while a chariot of fire picked up Elijah and carried him into heaven through a portal into heaven. And so when it was all over and Elisha came back across, the unbelieving prophet said, the spirit of the Lord picked up Elijah and dashed him on the rocks somewhere. They said the Holy Ghost killed Elijah. The spirit of God is killing his prophets is what they said because all they saw was the whirlwind. Well, now you know Satan hid life behind death and took the credit for it. Well, there's a lot of reason things happen, but one reason is the earth begins to react when God speaks in the earth. It hears that sweet voice, that wonderful voice, and it reacts. That day Jesus died. Jesus said, unless I die and am planted like a seed, he said, I can't grow up and produce life. It can't come up and produce life. Resurrection seed was planted. When it did, the earth just started reacting. It wants to be back. It groans in travail. It wants to be back with its, with its God. And now it's depending on the sons of God to reveal themselves to it by speaking his word. When God speaks, he's preparing something. He's producing motion. Uh, he is building something. Things move. Things shake. Things happen. Glory to God. Glory to the living God. In the Hebrew wording, it's revealed that when God created in the beginning, if a man had been standing there, especially a sinful man, and could see the explosions that happened, the fire, the quaking, the mountains, it, it, reveals to us that his bones would have just turned loose from its joints. It would have been too much to, for them to see in his fallen state. He would fall apart. He couldn't stand it. This is the quaking in, of fear demons feel, lost humans feel, and the reverence God's children sense. This is why when old prophets would come to town in the Old Testament, the people would tremble. Samuel came to town and said they trembled, wanted to know if it was well because God was about to speak on the earth.
In the time God primarily spoke on the earth, he, sp he spoke from heaven, but not as much then. He still speaks on the earth. Look at the motion of weather now. The earth still hears him speak. And prophets still hear and pronounce. But now he's also speaking from heaven. And the heaven is shaking. Now, one reason heaven is shaking is because there's a building program going on there. Have you ever woke up in the morning and heard if they're building in your city or in your town, you can hear the sounds of the building going on. You can hear giant hammers dry, drilling in steel to go down and are, are drilling down to find a, a solid base to set the buildings on. You can hear sounds of backup horns. Beep, beep, beep. You can hear all kinds of sounds of loaders running and, and all kinds of things going on. The city's building. Heaven is shaking. One reason is because God is building something. There's a building program going on in heaven daily and it sometimes can be heard hallelujah you never know you don't know how many times you've heard a boom come out of the heavens and nobody can explain what it is somebody's mansion may have just went up there could be a they could be building daily there in saint john 12 verse 28 jesus prayed this he said father glorify thy name then there then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. That it thundered, speaking from heaven. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice. So it was God speaking from heaven. This voice came not because of me, he said, but for your sake. And then he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. God speaking from heaven is the time of judgment of the world. Think about it. This is what's happening right now. Wicked men are scared. Men in high places and wicked places, they're scared right now. They're trembling. The devils in them are trembling. Because every time God speaks, something in them pulls at them to come back. They can't stand it because their vanity and their lust holds on to their agenda. And they will not turn it loose. And the devil on the inside begins to shake and quake. And he bristles up inside the man and the men will lash out at God. And they must stop, kill more of the unborn, do this, do that, uh, put wicked leaders in rule, fail. If you have to break them, if you have to inject them with disease, whatever it takes, do not let righteousness have its way in this earth. But it's the time of the judgment of the world. And God is speaking from heaven. He's speaking from heaven, and the only reason you don't see any more of it happening now is because he's doing it under the dispensation of grace. But prophets are speaking. And there's no difference in an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet except one thing. It's called G-R-A-C-E, grace. That's the only difference. Still a prophet will hear, thus saith the Lord, all capitals, Yahweh, Jehovah. Thus saith the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, Jehovah, thus saith the Lord. This harvest is coming to the earth, and boom, it happens. But it's under grace. God spoke to Jesus, and it sounded like it thundered, shaking in heaven as well as earth. His creative voice, sound, and movement for elements to arrange themselves for building, preparing for something that is coming, a new heaven, a new earth. Now heaven is shaking as God is speaking there. What is he doing? What is he doing speaking from heaven? St. John 14, 2, in my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place. You're hearing the preparations of heaven. The word and his speaking in heaven. 
himself. Preparing, building, preparing for a huge amount of people that are going to come there soon. The building program in heaven is huge because it has to, now listen close to this. The building program in heaven is huge because it has to include not only a person's taste, but it has to also include their desires and their complete satisfaction in righteousness. In other words, your mansion, your place he prepares for you is not only going to include the taste of what you like to see, your furniture, your, your surroundings and all of that, but it also has to be a place where the power of God lives and the building he prepares lives on the inside and it's totally inside your domain. The place he's preparing for you will house all your desires, all your tastes. All your, your dreams, everything happens in your place. In righteousness, of course. It's almost like that, that holodeck on, on one of those sci-fi programs where you go into it, program it, and it just comes alive on the inside of that deck. In heaven, that's why there's so many wild things there. The place he's preparing is huge because it has to not only include a person's taste, but also their desires and complete satisfaction in righteousness. A lot of the booms you're hearing very well could be building in heaven for God's family that will soon arrive. In the mansions that are prepared for you in your house, it will not only house your taste, but almost like that holodeck I talked about, but it'll be real. Complete, unadulterated fulfillment in righteousness. The technology of heaven that does this will be more mind-boggling than you've ever dreamed of because it's spirit power, not earthly power. And the day will come he'll bring the new Jerusalem to the earth. It is creative power. And that is instantly producing, it's that of instantly. It is a creative power of that, and it's instantly producing faith. It's a faith that produces instantly, is what I'm trying to say. The place where faith, hope, and love all work together in your life to produce instantly. All inside a place prepared for you. You know, I, I was studying this, and all at once, it just popped up on the screen of the phone, my phone I was looking at, Meta. It just suddenly popped up, and I knew that the Lord had arranged this, and I, I asked why. I said, why did this word appear here? I even wrote it right here. I said, why, does this word, why did this word appear here on its own? Show me, Lord, in Jesus' name, the highest name of all. The gracious Savior sent the answer. This is why. It is a counterfeit in this world, a building program in the earth, a world that satisfies the lust and desires of your flesh in the earth. The metaverse, a virtual reality world, the counterfeit of the building program in heaven. Satan's voice speaking in the earth in the metaverse the dead verse, but speaking in the minds of people, preparing a place for them. And people like Yuval Noah Harari is a false prophet of that world, trying to create a metaverse of cyborgs, non-humans, and so forth out of his own mouth. A world where your minds are invaded with Satan's world, Satan's thoughts, a world where he can prophesy from an AI into the thoughts of every person. Aiding an intrusion into the souls of men to change thoughts and behaviors and so forth. And that's what it's about. So when we start thinking about these things, we have to start thinking about God speaking in earth. He spoke on the earth, but now he speaks from heaven. He speaks on the earth and from heaven. 
And we have to understand these things. And we're just now just dabbling into this. And some people may say, oh, Brother Robin, that was, that was so heavy. I don't even understand half what you said. Yeah, but something in you does. Spirit of God in you is quickening those words. And we're moving to another level to where we can understand more of heaven and earth and how God operates in it and why things are happening on the earth, why they happen in heaven and what wicked men are trying to do. And you'll find out as we go, as the Lord begins to unveil things, that things are not so as far out as you thought. And men in the earth know what they're doing. A lot of them know exactly what they're doing. No wonder Harari said, no wonder he said, 2020 was the year when men agreed to be surveyed under the skin. What could he be talking about? Well, that's just a, a statement. Well, then what does it mean? Well, it's just some kind of statement. He's not a medical doctor. What does it mean? Then he, he starts in on cyborgs and being kind of not human but yet human and, and just on and on talking about things that you used to would have laughed at. Not anymore. Not anymore. And then if I, I'm so far out, then why did Fox News bring a witch on their program not the, uh, the other day? Or the Fox Network. Why did they bring this witch on there and let her throw out tarot cards? Tarot cards. Straight up occult. Yeah, they only brought them to make fun of it. Really? You really think so? No, they didn't either. Nobody comes on and throws out demonic tarot cards. They were consulting her on the air in front of the world. It was on the Jesse Waters program. He consulted her. Now, whatever the motive was, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you something. I know what the motive was. They were consulting a witch. Man, we didn't really mean it. Then you ought to fix what makes it look like it. Nobody brings a cauldron stirring witch on a, on a program and asks them to predict the future with their demonic from hell tarot cards spewed out of the devil's rear end. Why didn't they ask a prophet to come on there? There's many prophets right now around. Why didn't they ask a prophet? Because they don't consult prophets. A prophet gives them the answer they don't want. They want to hear what Satan says, but not hear what God says through his mouthpieces in the earth. Why didn't they bring a prophet on head to head with that witch? Because the witch might have manifested a demon and started throwing up on the stage. And then threw these cards out and said, uh-oh, Trump lost. Well, I'm a prophet of God, and I'm saying, uh-oh, Trump won. And I'll put my words out in the name of the Lord Jesus as a prophetic utterance against the utterance of a, of a damned witch. Oh, Brother Robin, you shouldn't cuss. You need to look up that word. If you think I'm cussing, why don't you just shut up and quit criticizing every time God speaks through a prophet? It tells me what side you're on. You probably bought the deck of cards for. Don't start on me about that. We are in a time. Man, I just think you're very extreme. I am extreme. I'm very extreme. God is very extreme. His word is very extreme. Elijah was very extreme. Elisha was extreme. Elijah walked out on the scene and told Jezebel, dogs will eat you by the wall of Jezreel. Dogs will lick up the blood of Ahab by the well, uh, by Naboth's vineyard. Because of you had Naboth killed to steal his vineyard. And don't you know everybody look? Oh, oh, he said dogs would eat her. Maybe it's metaphorically. And Elijah would have said, uh-uh. Well, we're glad Elijah's off the earth, they thought. He's already caught away. Some of the prophets said the Lord killed him. 
Elisha said, no, he didn't. I saw him. He got in a chariot of fire, and he went up through the heavens. And so other prophets mocked Elisha and said, well, why don't you go up, you bald head? In other words, you bald head, you don't have a covering anymore. He's gone. Why don't you go up the way you said he went up? We don't believe prophets. Sons of the prophets didn't believe the man because they were looking at the whirlwind of death that hid him from them. And they gave the credit to death, that death overcame the prophet Elijah. But they couldn't bring themselves to say that. So they said the Spirit of the Lord sent the whirlwind to kill him. Do you know how asinine that is? After Elijah had been prophesying, he was going to be caught away. He was going to be caught away. He was going to be caught away. And they said, no, the Spirit of the Lord caught him away, all right, and busted him in pieces all over the rocks. Elisha said, no, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Let us go. Let us go. He said, go. But I'll guarantee you this. Here's something you may have never thought about. I don't think Elisha parted the water for them to go over and look. They had to swim. Yeah, go look, but just swim over there because I ain't splitting it. Think about it. Elijah parted the water for him and Elisha to walk over. The whirlwind showed up and hid the two prophets walking. Elijah had told Elisha, said, what do you want me to do for you before I'm taken, not before I'm dashed on the rocks? I mean, this would have been pitiful. What do you want me to do for you? Elisha, Elisha, you stuck with me. Oh, my God. Elisha, I need to reveal something to you. God's going to break me in pieces. He's just going to smash me on the rocks. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to feel, but I'll do something for you before I go. Elisha would have said, mm -mm, don't do nothing for me. Just, just let it be because he may kill me next. But something about that old prophet made Elisha want something so bad. Hey, you shouldn't be make, mocking like that. If Elijah can, can hear me in heaven, he's probably belly laughing over what I just said. I mean, I'm in his family. Hallelujah. There's a street up there for the prophets. I got a house there. That's awesome. I'll be over to Elijah and Elisha's house every day sitting at the store. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. I want to know. I want to know. And so can you imagine that? But something about he had saw power in that old prophet's life. What do you want me to do for you before I'm taken? He said, I want a double portion of your consciousness, your spirit. I want a double portion of what you have. He said, you've asked a hard thing. But if you see me when I'm taken, if you can see what really happens when I leave this world, you can have it. Fifty prophets standing in Jericho, looking across from the other side. Why didn't when the water parted, they all took off running up behind Elijah and Elijah and run over there with them? The water was parted. They don't want no part of that power. They like living in an accursed city. They like living in the city Jer uh, Joshua cursed. But here it goes. They watch him. The water comes back together. The whirlwind shows up, the devil. Don't you know the devil saying, I'm going to let death take the credit for this. Hey, prophets, the Lord killed him. And they told Elisha that trash. Elisha comes back. He takes the Toledo of Elijah. He parks the water, crosses over, comes back up there at Jericho. And when he comes back over there, this prophet standing here that won't cross looks over and makes an astute Assumption, no observation. The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Really, it didn't really take a prophetic gift to see that. 
when he parted the Jordan again. So he comes back over. He said, the Spirit of the Lord killed Elijah. He said, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. We have 50 men here that can stand to go, that has the Constitution, strong men that can go over there and they can stand to see Elijah with his brains beat out on a rock. And he said they talked to him until he was ashamed. Probably of them. He said, go. Go. Don't you know they probably got down there by the Jordan looking at Elisha saying, you going to part it for us? You made this bed, you lay in it. Here they go across the Jordan, trying to get across. Some of them swallowing water. They get on the other side. Three days and nights they search for him. He come back, and Elisha said, I told you, don't go. Oh, this city is wonderful. It just ain't got no water. Well, then it ain't wonderful, is it, Hoss? Ain't got no water. It's cursed, but they don't know the difference. But a prophetic word from a real prophet who dared believe in resurrection power spoke a spring into existence that is there to this day. It's called Elisha Springs today down around Jericho. And there's still date palm trees growing there. And the springs are still flowing there from a prophetic word. Prophetic word creates springs in the desert. And so there, there you are, and these kind of prophets in the earth. I don't know how I got off on all that. Somebody help me. How did I get off on all that? <laughs> and so these, you see these, these witches are being consulted and not prophets. When witches consult, governments and high people consult witches. They activate the harvest of death. Saul, the king, who had no more kingdom, but occupied the throne anyway. He was bogus. It had already been given to David and the anointing to be king. Him, and he, he took his sons with him, Jonathan took his son and went to the witch of Endor and said, I want to talk to the prophet Samuel. And the witch of Endor said, I see an old man with well, like prophet robes. Saul didn't see him. She said she saw him, lying witch. Saul said, it's Samuel. But it was something that that, conjured up image she said i see gods coming up out of the ground well our god don't come up out of the ground he came up out of it one time when he rose from the dead and that's when he defeated the gods of the ground and she said and those spirits said tomorrow you and your sons will be with me talking about you're going to die tomorrow and they did you don't consult witches without paying a heavy price now, I don't know what all that is going to translate to, but you just, you just watch. Something has changed. Repent. How about repenting? You're under grace. Just repent. Let the Lord bless you. Let the Lord use somebody for a while. Hallelujah. So anyway, I don't know how I got off on all that, but I'm off on it. And so here, here we are in this time and it's agitating people because prophets are speaking. They're speaking. Heaven is speaking on the earth. And it makes demons tremble and shake and everything. Hallelujah. So I release my words today as a prophet. Uh-oh, Trump won. Every prophet in the earth ought to start saying that right now. You ought to stand up and release your words into the air against the words of that cauldron stirring witch. I bind that tongue of that witch. Don't, don't lay your tongue anymore against a righteous man or against a covenant nation that God built. 
America was built because we loved Jesus. Israel was built because God loved Israel. The two nations in the earth built on the love of the Almighty. And there ain't no room for a witch speaking against it. Hallelujah. I call them null and void. Now, angels of the Lord, you go forth and do what you need to do in this earth. I release you to go forth. You go forth and begin to arrange things in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The day of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. That's what it's like right now. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's been a good 11th hour today. It's been an awesome 11th hour today. We've been talking about God speaking from on the earth and from heaven. We talked about the building program in heaven. There are things being set in motion because a huge number of people are getting ready to come to heaven. It's called the rapture of the church. Amen. That's what Elijah represented. Amen. Well, Krista, you ready? You know, and Elijah, Elijah would represent the body of Christ, we which are alive and remain. One of the Bible codes, and I don't know if it was in the English codes or the Hebrew codes, crossed that scripture and said, Moses, he resurrected. And that's the area Moses' body was buried in. So he would have represented the dead in Christ rising. And Elijah represented, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that would explain why Elisha looked up and said, my father, my father. He saw Moses and Elijah. He wanted that double portion. And we don't have time to talk about it today, but Moses was Elijah's, uh, that's who he studied after. He wasn't alive at the same time, but that's who he studied after was Moses. And so he would have called him, my father, my father. You think about that. And so it would have represented, where did they learn all that from? On the Mount of Transfiguration. When they stood there beside Jesus and the Bible said Jesus taught them. And when they went back to their perspective times, then all Moses comes with, puts a veil over his face. And Elijah starts parting water. Hallelujah. Well, that's pretty heavy a subject for another day. Amen. Come on, Krista, and we got to tell the people how to prosper. Amen. Amen. Well, so anyways, it's offering time on the 11th hour. And uh, if you would like to give today, you'd like to sow your seed, you feel led to sow your seed, or this is where you sow every week, then you can do so by going to robindbullock.com. And the ways to give are on the screen. Also, before I get into the message, while you are on robindbullock.com, you can also go to the upcoming events tab on the website where you will find the link link to Intelligence Briefing Live in Carbondale, Illinois with Robin and Steve. And that is with our dear friends at the Elijah Stream and Steve Schultz. And that is going to be an awesome time. That's on March the 9th. That's a Saturday, March 9th in Carbondale, Illinois. Small town in Illinois, but we're, we're going to be packing a punch. It's a very strategic town, very strategic place. The date was picked strategically. The town was picked strategically. I know I was in the meeting, so I, I know exactly why and why the Lord had it that way. And so you just have to, you'll have to come. It's going to be a powerful time. And uh, so go to the upcoming events. You'll find all the information there. The seating in that venue, due to it being such a small town, is limited. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was able to get in. So go and find all the information on the by going to that link. Like I said, it's a small town, town in Illinois, but the Lord plans on doing big things. Amen. And we hope to see you there. And guess what? That's just first of many. There are more to come and to be announced. So I believe the next one will be in South Carolina. 
And so that will be in April, and so we'll be announcing that very, very soon with the link for that one also. They're, they're working on that, our friends at Elijah Stream. And uh, while I'm getting this together, also, if you want to tune in this week, Dad will be on uh, Flyover Conservatives, who are also going to be with us at Intelligence Briefing Live in Illinois with David and Stacy. That's this Thursday, so we'll be posting the exact time of when it'll be, but that's this Thursday on Flyover Conservatives. And also on, I think, yeah, this Thursday, I'll be with Jeff on Elijah Fire. So got a big week coming up <laughs> got a really big week but um so i was just wanting to let you know that while i was flipping through the scripture here you know psalm 103 says bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits so when it comes to prospering, that's who, that's who prospers you right there. It's not, you have to remember when you prosper, you have to remember that is a benefit from the Lord. Never forget that. It says forget not all his benefits. It didn't say forget not the benefits of my job, which that is great. But you know who gave you that job? the Lord. You know who blesses you? It continues to go down. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, and who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed as the eagles. That's something I quote every single day. And all of these things are benefits from the Lord. You know, I, I think a lot of times people, people forget that, see, we say all the time, my family has said it for years, we say that man is not our source. Man is not our source. And I think some people actually, they don't realize that we actually mean what we say. When, when we say that, man is not, he's not our source. I don't live off of your giving. I live off of mine. Why? Because I know where my benefits come from. I know where my prosperity comes from. Austin and I were standing in the kitchen last night and he gets a call from his mom. And she said, I've got a surprise for you. He said, what is it? She said, a check just came in the mail for over a couple thousand dollars. So needless to say, I'm standing in the kitchen going, hallelujah. <laughs> and that was in addition to a previous check he had just gotten in the mail. Because I even asked him, I said, what is that the same check? And he said, no, this is different. So glory to God, all from, giving. all from giving. Why? We both know where our benefits come from. We know where our prosperity comes from. My friends watching on the other side of this camera, I don't get up here and encourage you to give because I need your money. I don't encourage you to give because I need your money to put gas in my car. I need, and I know there's people on the other side of that camera watching right now, and you're going to snag this. You're going to make a reel about it. Why? Because I know you did it last week, and guess what? I watched it. Great job. Thanks. How you doing? <laughs> so I'm here today to tell you I don't need your money. I don't need your giving to prosper me. I need this. To prosper me. I need to get in this. I need to give into this. Into the kingdom of God. Why? Because I know where my benefits come from. They don't come from you. They don't come from anybody on the other side of that camera. They don't come from any one person. They don't come from people I know. They come from the Lord. 
And so even in the most trying times, even in when it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. These are the times that try men's souls. Even in these times that try your soul, I continue to say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, and forget not His benefits. He's the one who prospers my life. He's the one that gave me the car to drive. He's the one that gave me the home to live in. He's the one that gave me the job that I have. He's the one that built this facility that we're standing in right now. He's the reason why these cameras are on. And it don't matter who comes and who goes in and out of this facility. It don't matter who comes and who goes out of our life. You were not the source of my benefit from the get-go. And so when in the most trying times I remember forget not his benefits because if I continue to bless the Lord oh my soul and forget not all his benefits guess what whether you stay or you go out of my life his benefits stay his benefits stay with me why because I forget them not and you need to do the same because all of you I guarantee you if you especially if you're connected with this ministry these are the times that try men's souls. Why? Because you're still standing. You're still fighting the good fight of faith. We're still, we're still believing. We're still praying. And it gets trying sometimes. And it is easy to bow. You can't judge the people that bowed when the music played that day. You can't judge them. Why? Because you might have done the same thing. You don't know. It's easy to do it. We just have to pray that we have the boldness like the three Hebrew children that said, I will not bow. I will not bow. Though your legs be shaky. I was doing lunges yesterday and I thought to myself, I heard my mom's phrase, though your legs be shaky, stand. And I said, from the remix Bible, I said, though, I said, though your, what did I say? Um, oh, I, I lunge by faith. Lunge by faith and not by feel. <laughs> That's from the remix Bible. But I said, but as a quote from my pastor, though your legs be shaky, stand. And so today I encourage you all, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, and forget not his benefits. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, today, if you're fired up now to give, we want to quote the word of God over you that never fails. This is not just a pre-made quote that we put together. This is not just a feel-good confession. This is the word of God straight out of the scripture and every Bible in existence will back me up on that except the remix Bible, and that one is in the trash. <laughs> Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. You say, I believe it, I receive it, I call it done in Jesus' name. Now for the tither, same thing. Straight out of the scripture, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts say, I believe it I receive it and I call it done in Jesus name amen so be it thank you Krista you know it is it is easy to bow it is because the world gravitates toward bowing. The world gravitates toward bowing. And people has this idea, go ahead and bow. God will forgive you later. There will be people that may take the mark of the beast, do the same thing. But you know, here's the way you have to do that. You have to say, 
With God as my helper, I will not bow. And you bring God in on it. You, you, you can't not bow under your own power, but you bring God in on it. With God as my helper and his word in my heart and in my mouth, I will not bow. And you know what? Robin said that, though your legs be shaky. I remember the day she was given that prophetic utterance. Though your legs be shaky, stand. When it's all over, you'll be glad you did. Hallelujah. Because we're, we're not only going to win, we've already won. We've already won. See, it's just like you, people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get healed. No, you are the healed. And Satan's trying to take your health away from you. He's trying to steal your health. You are the prosperous. He's trying to steal your, your prosperity away from you. You've already won. And he's putting up a fight because he's being evicted. He's being evicted out of high public offices. He's being evicted out of the head of, uh, of the highest office in this nation. He's being evicted out of Congress. He's being evicted out of the presidency. He's being evicted out of all the House of Representatives. He's being evicted out of governor's positions, out of mayor's positions, out of city hall positions. He's being evicted right now. And he brought in his big guns, witches, to throw their little silly cards out on the table. He's trying everything he can. And if they didn't believe in it, then why use witches? Why would you consult such things? You know, why did Hillary Clinton hold a seance in the White House when she was there? If they don't believe in this stuff, then why act like you do? Are you just having a party and this is a party favor like pin the tail on the donkey? We'll try the occult today. We'll conjure up Eleanor Roosevelt today. Well, no, you won't. Eleanor's wherever she went. She's already there. She ain't coming back. So then what is this? I mean, if, if, you do, if people don't believe this stuff, quit acting like you do. God is still God, and God will not tolerate this mess now. And he's not going to give up his covenant nation to you. Remember that he made a covenant with our founding fathers from the word. The Bible was open to Genesis 49, and, and George Washington spread that big hand of his on it swore an oath that God would be our God and then kissed the Bible. It was John Adams that would send letters home to Abigail and said, Abigail, we had a, in our time of fasting and prayer today in Congress, <laughs> we found Psalm 35. You've got to show your father this psalm. Her father was a minister. We're standing on Psalm 35, and it was the psalm of the Revolutionary War. It was the psalm that they drew the strength from to win it. Read Psalm 35. You'll see. These things were all given in covenant, and our founding fathers made a covenant with the Almighty. And God ain't going to give that up. And we're going to push a one world order into existence. And, you know, we're going to push out three people that could absolutely stop it. We're going to get rid of Trump. We're going to get rid of Netanyahu. We're going to have somebody maybe, maybe we can talk the world into killing Putin. Well, Trump left office, but he's coming back. Netanyahu was, was, was finagled out of office, but he came back. They tried to kill Putin, but he's still there. Oh, my God, what is going on? God is not giving up his nation. And when we're finished with it and everybody's finished and we go home to that big marriage supper, then Satan will have it for really only about three and a half years and he can't get it really going. So then at the end of it, yeah, he has to start broke because the wealth transfer took place. And so that's why it takes him the first three and a half years to gather enough money to, uh, to do his magic marker on people's hands and foreheads to, to get his second half going. And, and, and then, he, then at the end of that, he's, he's tossed like a mashed cow patty out in the middle of hell somewhere. 
And we'll all be standing there to shout when it happens. So what do I need to do today, Brother Robin? Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Jesus is the king. <laughs> He's the king, bless God, and we're glad. He's Lord, not some fool. So just to receive him as Lord. Paul said, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that he's your Lord, you'll be saved. So go ahead right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior, personal Savior. You'd have done it for me alone. I give my life to you right now. Take my life. Do something with it. I'm yours to command. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Forgive me of all sin. And we'll start new right now. Hallelujah. Then we'll stop there and say, Jesus baptized me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost at the River Jordan. The Holy Ghost descended on him like a dove. He never did one miracle until after that day. So if he needed to do that, you do too. So why don't you go ahead and say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Ghost in fire with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Thank him for it. Now just start speaking in tongues. Yeah, and, and can you see the occultic witchy world right now watching this? Because they watch this program. They watch this program. Can you hear them? Can you see their face now? What is he saying? Well, you'll never know. You'll never know. It's like that woman that was, uh, my sister used to tell the story of somebody who went into an insane asylum and trying to minister to this woman who'd lost her mind and she was drawing on her face with lipstick. And the woman trying to minister to her, she's just drawing all over her face with lipstick. That could be intimidating. Then all at once, she didn't know what to do, so she started speaking in tongues, praying in other tongues. And that woman just stopped drawing on her face and looked at her and growled out in this voice and said, you speak in a language that we can understand. Demons hate other tongues. They hate it. I mean, they hate it. They don't have a clue what you're saying. And you could be talking about how each one of them pop and burn from rock to rock in hell. All the, they, they don't know what you're talking about. You could be laughing at them because they all got in them pigs that day. I mean, they don't know what you're doing. But you're speaking mysteries hidden in God. Hallelujah. So go ahead today and make the jump to Jesus. Make the jump to Jesus. You know, if Jesus wasn't the real Lord of all, not Buddha, not Mohammed, not any of these other people, Jesus, he's the risen king. If he wasn't, have you ever noticed that every UFO story somebody tells where they were abducted, one of the things they say when they get back was Jesus is not real. That's, that's one of the first things they say. Why bring him into it? Why don't they come back and say, Mohammed ain't real. Buddha's not real. Why don't they come back and start talking about that? Why don't they come back and say, George Washington never existed? They never, they don't say anything. It's always Jesus because that's the name above every name that at that name, every knee has to bow. Every tongue has to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. And they know that name. And the scripture says the devils know there's one God and they tremble. Hallelujah. Paul went to, remember seven sons of Sceva went to try to cast out a demon out of somebody. And they looked at him and said, we command you, we adjure thee by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of him. And those demons answered, those, those demonic red-butted devils answered out of him. And they said, those necking devils, <laughs> those naked ones. How do you know? Because they stripped them old boys down too. And they looked at him and said, Paul we know and Jesus we know. 
Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? Devils know who Jesus is. Hallelujah. And he's the king. And I plead the blood of Jesus over all of our partners. I do every day. Every night in my prayers when I'm praying over you, and I don't miss a night of that. And I'm praying over you, holding your names in my hand. I'm praying over you. <laughs>